Aloha, welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Green, who knows me as Josh, Senator from Big Island, ER physician. Today we're gonna talk about the Queen's Clinically Integrated Physician Network, and I'm excited to be joined by our friend, Dr. Anna Lowengard. Dr. Lowengard is serving as the Chief Medical Officer of the Queen's CIPN, which we're gonna to explain to everyone today. She's had a very uh, extensive career in healthcare. She did her training at Mount Sinai back in New York where she was faculty. She was at SUNY for medical school. She also has come over here and been an executive at St. Francis and now takes on this role. The Queen's CIPN is the largest organized group of physicians working to improve outcomes, quality of care, deal with costs, make access a better issue for uh, healthcare in Hawaii in the entire state. So I'm really excited to have Anna join me today to give us an update about her program. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. You bet. So Anna, uh, this is really a fascinating time in healthcare. It seems like people are speaking in acronyms day in, day out. Uh, PCMH, we've had programs on patient center medical home, ACO, all these acronyms fly around, and now we have the CIPN. Why don't you kind of give us the um, kind of the basics about what this program is? So the Queen's Clinically Integrated Physician Network is really an attempt to bring all of the very individual physicians in the community into some kind of network that will be um, interrelated in terms of having um, a shared concept of what quality is, be able to refer to each other on, we're actually going to be launching um, a platform, a web-based platform people can refer to each other on, um, but also really determining what, what does quality mean for um, the primary care physicians, for all the specialists in our network, um, and being able to have some kind of shared accountability for a patient population. Most of the way healthcare has been, and it continues to be in many cases, um, reimbursed is on um, what we call fee-for-service. So for each encounter you have with a patient, you get paid as a physician or as a hospital, et cetera. And I think people are increasingly realizing over the last decade or so that that's probably not the best way to provide health care or pay for health care um, and so these you know accountable care organizations or clinically integrated networks have been formed with this eye towards a time when we'll be paid for the quality of care we provide not the quantity of care it's, it's really interesting because um, let me preface this by saying I've had shows uh, in the past many months where we talked about for instance the triple aim and we had uh, John Houck on the program, we've had Stephen Campbell, we've had all kinds of, you know, the thinkers in healthcare mm -hmm. on the show, uh, but we haven't often dug into the actual implementation, kind of the in the trenches program, which is what you provide. I should also okay. mention that, uh, so people understand where you're coming from, uh -huh. you are a clinician, you have been a geriatrician, you're a palliative care board specialist, mm -hmm. uh, certified specialist as well, so you really know what it is to yeah. provide this healthcare. And now we turn to you and the team at the CIPN mm -hmm. and we say, Okay, we've heard about quality, we've heard about the triple aim. How do we do it? Now, uh, tell, me, tell me how is the program structured? First of all, it always takes some resource to, to pay for a program. Are you working with the insurers? Uh, just so that our members can know. Sure. So right now, the Queen's CIPN is, uh, has one contract with HMSA for approximately 187,000 lives of their members. Um, right now, only their commercial um, policyholders. Uh, but we have a goal, you know, over time to actually increase the numbers of, of plans within HMSA, but also other health plans that we might contract with. So that's that's. Right now, it's really a partnership with HMSA. Um, I will say that Queens is also funding this venture. So it's really a partnership um, in recognition of this is really where we need to get to to be able to provide the highest quality care and potentially save costs and, and see where there may be some um, inefficiencies in our system that we could work on to improve the, the quality of care and then decrease the overall cost of health care as well. So you've got the big players involved. I'll remind our audience and our doctors that are participating in the program that 185,000 or 187,000 lives it's a big hunk of our population. We only have about 1.3 or so million people in the state, and only, I think, about 1 million or so are commercially uh, insured. So that's yeah. almost 20% of all the people in our state that are getting health care in this, in this system. Uh, now, Queens is the big player, HMSA is a big player. What about the yeah. docs? Who do you have uh, on the program? Yeah, so the way that Queens went about doing this was to actually engage some of the larger physician organizations. So most of our physicians around the patient center medical home and in other situations have been have joined um, independent physician associations. So Hawaii IPA, PMAG, right. there are a number of them, um, uh, uh, HQPO, who were really our founding members. And then now we actually have 10 physician organizations that make up 
help our membership. So it's really kind of a, a hub and a spoke, if you will, that the QCIPN is really um, sort of uh, the headquarters, and then we have these 10 organizations that make up our membership of physicians that we work with closely. Yeah, and for full disclosure, when um, you know I'm a medical director over at the Hawaii IPA, so my organization, as one of those 10, has had kind of the um, privilege of working with you and Whitney Lim and um, Amita and Ashley and all, all the team uh, watching this begin to come together. Mm -hmm. Now when I brought Whitney on the program or a year or so ago it was just starting and we were just beginning to get people involved. Mm -hmm. You mentioned 10 physician organizations. Mm -hmm. How many doctors does that mean? So we have about 270 primary care physicians and then uh, somewhat over 700 specialists. Um, and you know, some of them are, are particularly the specialists more or less involved. Um, and, and so as we go into our second year, and, and actually the other piece that we've only gotten in the last about two months is all of the data that we needed from HMSA to really understand this population that we're caring for and, and, and sort of um, at the same time understand which physicians really touch our patients uh, the most. And so we're really just beginning, uh, beginning to understand, uh, you know, how do we need to focus ourselves most efficiently? Right, it's, it's so interesting because uh, in the last 10 years, like you said, and even really in the last maybe four years since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, there's been this explosion of interest in uh, looking at health care costs. Uh, back in the day, I was speaking with um, an HMSA executive this morning when the GDP, the percent of, of money spent in our country on health care was lingering at 11 or 12 percent, people weren't too focused. And then when it got up to 17 or 18 percent, we seemed to reach a tipping point. And now everyone is looking at where can we practice not just better medicine and deliver better health care, but are we spending it in the right places? Is there a lot of waste in the system? Uh, do we need to rein in costs in one area so that we can invest in another area? And these seem to be some of the themes that the CIPN is working on. Is that yeah, fair? definitely. I mean, I think that we're trying to understand the needs of our population, understand you know where where our system really doesn't work for our patients and for our physicians too. You know, um, so really trying to. I think year one has really been putting the foundation together, really um, putting a team in place. You know, figuring out how to work with our physician organizations and get the the initial messages out to our physicians. And now I think with year two that we have this day. We're really looking at how can we make change? How do we build programs that will actually help our sickest patients, our most complex patients? And, you know, I think from our physician standpoint, and, you know, I've spent a lot of this year talking to our physicians and understanding, um, you know, it's been a while. My, my history as a primary care physician was actually doing home-based primary care in New York City. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of a specific view on healthcare, which really, I think, spurred me to do what I'm doing today because it really helped me to see where does our system fail our sickest people. Um, and so really looking at, you know, how do we need to design programs that will better address the needs of these patients and, um, and, and how do we, you know, the physicians I think are overwhelmed with, I think particularly primary care has taken such a hit in terms of um, quality of um, satisfaction in practice, you know, because I think that all of the quality reporting that we have is really on the primary care physician's shoulders. Um, and it, you know, I think that there's certainly something to be said for paying attention to our quality metrics. Um, that when you say quality metrics, why don't you tell our audience what yeah. does that mean? Is that so, so, you know, how many of your diabetic patients have their blood tests in the range you'd like it to be? How many of them have blood pressure in the range you'd like it to be? How many of your patients are getting screening for breast cancer and colon cancer as recommended? Those sorts of things that really have fallen upon the primary care physicians. And I think that many of them feel, and I think rightly so, um, that this is not necessarily improving the care that's being provided to patients. It's really just a way of showing the insurance company who are, who are you know, being asked to report these things you know, nationally, um, just showing the quality. And, and so it's not really equated, it's not really um, reflected in, oh, my patients are getting better care because my, my staff is spending so much more time reporting these things. And right. I, think, I think it's one of the things that we're really sensitive to is you know, how do we provide, how, as we, how do we as, a, as an, um, an entity that's really focused on quality and improving quality of care, how do we do that without just adding another layer of, okay, now jump through this hoop and do this? We really want to be able to provide infrastructure and to be some of the solutions rather than adding to the problems that I think physicians see in healthcare these days. I I'm so glad you said that. And, and when we, um, we get into our second segment, I think we'll start breaking into some of the specific programs that the CIPN may propose uh, to offer to physicians and therefore by association all of their patients. Uh, but you know, I've been observing from my 
perch, uh, what's been going on with the healthcare reform movement. And I have had those same concerns that you've had. For instance, electronic medical records seemingly could be significantly value adding to healthcare. On the other hand, sometimes I really get the feeling that I'm putting all this data into a computer system just so someone else can, can check it and can bean count it a little bit and decide whether or not we should use this antibiotic or do this test. I haven't felt personally that as a family practice doc and now as an ER doc that has helped me provide better care. Do I think we have to focus on population health? Yes. Am I grateful to HMSA for really pushing us on PCMH, patient-centered medical? Mm -hmm. I absolutely am. I thought that was very smart. However, a lot of the extra measuring mm -hmm. that goes on, I'm not sure patients end up feeling as better health care, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure the doctors mm -hmm. end up um, internalizing it as an improvement in what they do. I, I do hearken back to my family practice training days, and a lot of the things that we're talking about doing were embedded in the gestalt of actually mm -hmm. being a family practitioner or a geriatrician or a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And so I find it interesting mm -hmm that we're coming full circle now. That now we're really talking about those themes, delivering that in a practical way, but not just checking off the boxes mm -hmm. that we did these things. So um, it's very, very refreshing to hear that you're digging in. So tell me again, now first year, you had to organize these thousand doctors or so. How did you do that? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that we've completed that process, but you know, it's really about bringing them together um, and really sharing with them, frankly, what is a clinically integrated network? What's required? I mean, there are some legal requirements in terms of, you know, are we are we moving towards being more interconnected from a, a technology standpoint? You know, do we have shared best practice, so quality of care that we're providing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and really getting people to understand. I mean, I think that there is sort of a okay, I'll join. You know, yeah. which is understandable. I mean, most of these physicians are a full-time practice and they don't have time to be reading all of what those of us who really are focused on this all the time may know about these things. So I think really just educating people about, you know, what we're doing, what it actually entails and, um, and, and how we need them to be involved going forward. Okay. Yeah, I mean, even just the most basic things like getting everyone's email address and getting people, <laughs> ab you know, enabling them to come to a meeting yeah. every two months, a big town hall meeting uh, to really see what the details are about this, yeah. uh, this clinically integrated physician network has been a challenge. Yeah. Uh, we only have, say, 33, 3,400 practicing active physicians in our state. Yeah. So I really do think it's quite an accomplishment, and it's no surprise to me that it took the better part of a year to get them... Yeah all together uh, but now that we're starting to see them familiarize themselves mm -hmm. with the program uh, do you expect it to expand do you think it will still be a thousand are we happy with this size what's your feeling yeah. about that well, you know, I think it's it's going to be interesting. I think the next year will be very telling in terms of how many. Now that we really we have data to understand our patient population, I think that the um, what our contract for year two with HMSA is certainly more informed in terms of really understanding something more about our patient population and our physician population. Um, and so, you know, I think that we're pretty large for an organization uh, as we are. You know, I mean, this, the next largest one in the state is about eighty thousand lives, so less than half the size of what we are. Yes. Um, you know. You know, and, and so I think it's it's going to depend on um, can we really engage this number of physicians? Um, how do how do we how do we match our physician population to our patient population? And I, and I what I mean by that is mainly the specialists. So our our patients come to us because they're part they're they're taken care of by our primary care physicians who are in our network. Right. And then the specialists join. Um, and they don't have a particular attachment to patients. And so what we're right now looking at is how many of our specialists of our 700 plus really see a significant number of our patients. And then, you know, from there we'll have a better sense of who are our primary care physicians referring to and how do we create a network that's really meaningful in that sense in terms of really being a network that's caring for this 187,000 patients because we don't quite know that yet. Um, yeah, well, you, you actually made me think of something that we probably should mention before our first break, and that's that one of the main initiatives is the referral uh, communication uh, program. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about that? So if one of our physicians uh, as a member of the CIPN is watching but maybe hasn't attended some of the organizational yeah. meetings, what's the benefit? What are they asked to be a participating member of? 
Yeah, so the, our referral platform actually sits on top of the Hawaii Health Information Exchange, which is really um, finally um, becoming an, a reality. Um, yes. You know, many states across the country have done this, and it's really, it's essentially, you know, a, a clearinghouse, if you will, for um, healthcare data on our patients that would come from um, Queens hospitals, from the HSC hospitals, from Castle, um, you know, from HPH, hopefully eventually in Kaiser as well. Yes. Um, but really, where a physician who's seeing a patient for the first time, maybe be in the emergency room could actually go to understand who this patient is if they're not known to them, which I think would be a great um, asset for both physicians and patient alike. Right. So our, our referral platform actually, it's a, it's a website essentially, and our referral platform sits on top of that. But the beauty of that is it actually draws information about all these patients. So, um, you know, for our, our uh, physicians in the community, they don't have to to use this platform, they don't have to enter information on the patient. It's all there, and it self-populates. But the nice thing about it is that you know we have in our uh, thousand physicians, we have probably over 30 different electronic medical records. So that you know what they're actually putting information you know in on their patients that they use in their practice, none of them speak to each other. Even the physicians who are on the same electronic medical record don't speak to one another um, if they're outside of a hospital system. And so this is kind of the, an equalizer, if you will. Yeah. Um, you know, that this way our, our physicians can speak to each other about patients that they are sharing, um, and, and also that that information doesn't go anywhere. It's not a fax that gets lost. It's not a phone call that, you know, never gets answered, et cetera. It all can be done basically on this platform by email. Um, and I think it will just create great efficiency um, for both our physicians and, and their offices and their patients. Well, I think that uh, as we go into our first break, that's one of the first major benefits of the CIPN, which is uh, very basic but important communication about how we are taking care of our, our patients. So why don't we take a break? I'm Josh Green, your host at Healthcare in Hawaii, joined today by Dr. Anna Loengard, who's the Chief Medical Officer of the Queen's CIPN. Thanks for joining us. Aloha, how you doing? I'm Gordo the Tech Czar, here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we co-host Hibachi Talk where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also, my co-host with me today is... Andrew. Andrew, the, Andrew, the security guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii, and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. And you there, lad. It's Angus. I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh, look, you see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Letham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Medical Director at the Hawaii IPA. Senator from Big Island and ER physician. Today I'm joined by Dr. Anna Lowengard, who's the Chief Medical Officer of what's described as the Queen's Clinically Integrated Physician Network, the largest integrated group of physicians in our entire state working on quality and cost here in our, in our state's healthcare system. In our first 15 minutes, Anna was basically able to unpack the scope of the program, how large it is, and what they've done the first year. But now I get to turn to her and ask, what will the program focus on in its second year? And a, you're, you're a practicing physician. You know quite a lot about the healthcare system in Hawaii, maybe more than almost anybody else now that you've spent your time doing this. What are our biggest, I guess in summary, biggest healthcare challenges in the state? And then let's begin to talk about how the CIPN might be looking at addressing them. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the big challenges, you know, be no surprise to anyone. I think, you know, mental health um, is a huge problem and, and, and from many different angles, you know. So I think as, you know, we're looking at how do we decrease unnecessary um, use of the emergency room. Um, and you know, we actually did a needs assessment of our primary care physicians and one of the reasons for their patients who were using the emergency room, you know, five and more times in a year was behavioral health issues. And it's not really surprising that if we're not uncovering those problems in our primary care offices, which, you know, our primary care doctors have such a short window to see these patients that it's, not, it's, it's understandable why some of these things are not being addressed there. Um, and that was, that was borne out also by, I'm glad you mentioned that, the, um, the Healthcare Association, who've been on our program, of course, mm -hmm. found that to be the number one 
uh, preventable admission in the state of Hawaii as a class, mental yeah. health and yeah. mental um, health problems. So that's very good that there's synergy between what you found and what they yeah. found. Yeah, and I think that you know what we're seeing among our physicians is definitely an interest in, both for the pediatric and for the adult uh, population of how could we do this better? You know, knowing that we have limited resources, um, limited clinicians in these areas, um, how could we perhaps design a system that would provide better care for the people in our network, um, both for the people we have contracted lives for now, but looking broader, more broadly. And I think there's a lot of interest around the state um, at all levels, you know, public sure. and private um, at this issue right now. I think that um, also for our most complex patients, people living with serious illness, we, we know, and you know, it's something that having come here as a hospice medical director um, nearly six years ago, um, that this is a place where we spend a lot of money in Hawaii. That actually, you know, as you mentioned, we are a very low spend state um, for pretty much, you know, all uh, insurance plans, whether it's Medicare, or whether it's HMSA or other health plans here. Um, but in the last two years of life, we spend a lot more money. I mean, it just, it just, you know, skyrockets at that point. And I think that what many people have come to understand is that um, we're probably providing a lot of unwanted care, you know, that we're not um, understanding the real goals and preferences of patients um, for a number of different reasons. And it's not like, you know, one person or, you know, is to blame for that. But I think it's an area where we could put some more effort, energy and programming into place to um, elucidate people's goals and then provide the care they want. And I think that that's the other thing is you need to have programs in place that will actually support people's goals. Right. Um, if somebody says, well, you know, I never want to go to the hospital again and they don't qualify or don't want hospice and you say, well, that's nice, but, you know, call 911 when something happens, that's not really a solution or very satisfying for that patient and family. Sure. Yeah, you make it so, as you were saying that, you're you're speaking directly to my experience this uh, two weekends ago. I was on call. Uh, a gentleman came in, 95-year-old gentleman with his wife, who was much younger than he, but was still in her mid-80s. And so she brought him in. He had uh, a very rapid heart rate. He, uh, he had um, he was verging on ventricular fibrillation, had electrolyte abnormalities, but he was able to coherently tell me, and as his wife was certainly, and one of their daughters, they simply did not want him to have intubation. They didn't want to have a flight over to Honolulu. They wanted him to be comfortable. And it really, even that uh, situation was very clearly expressed. Uh, some of the nursing staff was still wondering when we would be transferring the patient, and they wanted to know whether or not they should get the crash card out or how much of advanced resuscitation we should prepare for. And I had to very gently say, no, this is the patient's desire. Uh, he may pass. I was able to um, talk to his wife very candidly. And actually, in this case, he did pass mm -hmm. away later in that day. Uh, but he really didn't want aggressive therapy that might have kept him alive for a few days, but he was going to die soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and at 95, he had had a wonderful life. He wanted to die on the Big Island. He wanted to have family come be with him. But there was still that pressure yeah. from the system. And I think what you're expressing is we can do a better job with a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, in, our, in our state, in our culture here, our healthcare culture, to get them to a place where they get the care they want. And maybe we spend that money up earlier in life. Maybe we catch certain diseases earlier. Uh, this brings us to kind of how the system will work with the CIPN. Mm -hmm. If that's what you see in the healthcare system, which I totally agree, that we have to kind of rethink how we're going to spend our monies, what kind of programs have you begun to set up to help the physicians who might be watching today to support the CIPN? What are you looking at in the second year as you begin to roll out programs? There must be a lot of programs. I've heard a few of them. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, one of the major things that we've seen that's a huge puka in our system is, is social work services. You know, that there is no fee-for-service based um, way to get reimbursed for that. And because we have such a diffuse um, setup of our physicians, so, so many of them practice in practices of one and two, yes. but they don't have the opportunity to hire their own social services um, experts. And so that's actually been our first hire for our sort of, you know, care coordination, clinical care coordination is, social, is a social worker. And we're actually hiring another one if there's anyone who's looking for a job who would like to do this kind of work. But, yes. um, you know, and looking to design our clinical programs based on the needs of our patients as we understand that more broadly. And also understanding from our, 
our physicians. So our referral platform that we're actually looking to bring about 400 of our physicians onto by the end of November, mm -hmm. um, our, our care coordination team will be on that referral platform so that our, all of our physicians in the community to access these services will just have to get on the referral platform and then send a referral, you know, with a checklist of, you know, why they're sending a referral and what they're actually hoping to get out of that. So I think that that's going to be one of our, our major uh, program development pieces for, for year two. Let me actually unpack that a little bit. So let's, let's pretend like we're talking directly to one of the thousand doctors that have joined the CIPN or who might be interested in the future in joining. Uh, they have a couple patients in their practice that are very complicated. They may have some mental illness like you described. They also have maybe lung disease. Maybe they have had some heart ailments. Mm -hmm very complicated, they're in and out of the hospital frequently. How does the care for this patient vis-a-vis -vis the CIPN work? What would be their yeah. first thing? So I think for anyone who's complicated, where the physician's really feeling like, I need more resources than my office has, um, it would be a matter of referring that patient to us. We, uh, right now our team consists of a social worker and a, uh, a nurse practitioner um, who's our clinical manager. And, and we look to expand on that team as we understand what our needs are. We want to we want to make sure people we hire are actually the right people. Yeah. Um, but what they would do is they would actually assess that patient. And depending on the patient and the circumstance, it might be over the phone, it might actually be in person. Mm -hmm. It could be in the physician's office it might be in the patient's home if they're really incapacitated and need that level of care. Um, but it would also be looking at, you know, what services exist in the community that might help this patient and, you know, and also the caregivers and family because, you know, just as frequently it's, it's they who need the help um, as much as the patient. Yes. Um, so it's really trying to come up with a, a care plan going forward. So, you know, maybe it's um, there are financial issues, you know, maybe there, there are psychosocial issues in the family that need to be resolved. Right. Um, and so frequently it's really understanding what is available in the community. We really want to be a connector of sorts. You know, there's a, there's a lot of really great people doing great things in this community, and we'd like to really um, be able to, you know, put people into the right programs that will help them. So as you describe it, it sounds almost like the CIPN becomes a, um, an asset for the small practice or the small cluster, the independent physician community, that it's almost a clearinghouse where, you know, practice might have three, four, ten challenging patients that they would love to give more time to, they would love to provide more service to. It's impossible in their day of seeing 30 or 40 patients. They contact the CIPN through the, um, through the referral-based uh, program, which lays on top of the HHIE, the Health Information Exchange. We've had people on the program mm -hmm. talking about that. Then you say, okay, we have service A, B, C, D. We might even have a nurse practitioner that can come to your house or certainly can mm -hmm. coordinate these care programs, social services. Now, are you actually caring for the, that part of the patient's uh, health care experience? Yeah, well, I think, we, you know, we are building a care coordination team so that we would, you know, and, and I think that we're looking to figure out what the needs are. How do we... Um, how do we work with the existing program? So Queens has a house calls program within their Department of Geriatrics. Yeah. They have a small outpatient palliative care program. So we're trying to figure out how do we how do we take these clinical resources and make them work within the system? You know, we have we have physicians and patients on neighbor islands. How do we make our system work for them? Do we contract with existing resources, which we, we know, you know, may be very few in some places. Um, sure. And these are all things that we're looking to tackle in, in year two um, to see, you know, where is the need and how do we try and meet it. It's interesting because, again, I'll, um, I'll harken back to the older days, not that long ago, where we were trained as family practitioners and general practitioners to be able to provide those services, but I think that the world just got too complicated. and. Uh, it's now, I guess, impossible, you know, my, my time as a primary care physician in Hawaii was 2000 to 2004. I was in a little rural community and I did some house calls and, and we had limited resources, but I had limited responsibilities too, so I could jet around the community and do these things. I can't imagine a, a, uh, a busy physician in Honolulu or Maui trying to do that now. So now it looks like we've had to develop other systems. and these integrated systems, Queen's CIPN in this case, are taking that space, that responsibility. So you're now in partnership mm -hmm. with the physician community, though you are a physician, of course. Uh, I think we should mention that most, if not all, of your decisions are made by this physician community that came together, this board. Absolutely, yeah. So our board is, is made up of, I believe it's 13 physicians. Okay. Um, and so, yes, I mean, I think it, it's a really important point because, um, you know, I think that 
there, many people say, oh, well, isn't this sort of HMOs all over again? Um, and I think that that is the defining difference, is that this is led by physicians, um, and that's a huge um, distinction to make between, you know, a, a health plan deciding what needs to happen and what services can be provided for a certain population of patients. This is really driven by physicians, practicing physicians. Yes. Um, and, and that's a, a hugely important distinction about, you know, it's really giving the physicians the opportunity to say, what is quality care for your patients? And, and how do we do this? And how do we do this reasonably? You know, I mean, we, we all know that um, some physicians, you know, may, um, may follow practice guidelines more than others and you know how, how do we educate physicians once they're long out of training yes. um, I mean I think it's hard I, I think it's hard to keep up with you know what's the latest um, what's the best out there you know and I think just trying to um, bring that education as well to our network so it's interesting so before we take our next break uh, we've talked about first organizing the physicians they get to lead their own organization with some backing from Queens and obviously the insurer HMSA in this case you now have the additional benefit of service, which you're going to have a clearinghouse of additional services to give to patients, especially the complicated patients that maybe need a better way to find their best care in their lives. And then a new addition for doctors that are watching it today, whether you're a member of PMAG or Hawaii IPA or HQ or whomever, you'll be able to access um, kind of state-of-the-art, uh, cutting-edge, protocols and what's going on uh, you know I'm a primary care person but I might not have the first clue any longer what's done in nephrology on this issue so you envision that as another service for the CIPN why don't we do this um, we spent about a half hour breaking it down uh, how you put this organization together who's in it uh, why don't we take our break and when we come back we'll talk about some of the specific programs that you envision in year two mm -hmm. how it might impact patients and doctors alike Great. okay this is Josh Green, your host at Healthcare in Hawaii. Thanks for joining me today to talk about the Queen's Clinically Integrated Physician Network. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborate and, and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there. 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Aloha. My name is PJ, and I'm the host of Hawaii Sports Update. I am very interested in local sports, and that's why I host the Hawaii Sports Update show. I bring in guests from Hawaii. I bring in guests from UH. I bring in guests from the community. I bring in big names. I bring in small names. I bring in all names that are community related and doing positive things, sports related in the community. Come join me every Tuesday at 1 p.m. here on Hawaii Sports Update. You can also join me on my golf tournament, the first annual PJ Sports Radio Show Golf Tournament. It's going to be held at Coral Creek. For any information, go to Think Tech. Hawaii, INC, and friend us. The PayPal and a summary of the event will be right there available for you. And don't forget to tweet us. Take a two minute flow. Uh -oh. Aloha, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green from the Hawaii IPA State Senate and the ER on Big Island. Today I'm joined by uh, Dr. Anna Lohengard, who is an expert in healthcare transformation. She's worked as a physician for many years. She was chief medical officer over at St. Francis, and now she's the chief medical officer of the Queens Clinically Integrated Physician Network. This is a group of about 1,000 physicians of our total 32, 3,300 that are practicing in Hawaii, working to get together to better provide services for our patients, to improve outcomes, to deal with some of the high costs of healthcare, and really to provide a better healthcare way forward. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. So today we've talked um, about so many of the details in your first year, uh, Anna. Uh, now I want to dig in uh, for our physicians that are members and watching the show and, and their patients. I'd like to dig into what you expect to actually work on in year two. What are some of the programs and goals? Yeah, Just so rattle some off for me. 
So advanced care planning, as I mentioned earlier, you know, getting wanted care for patients, getting them to actually um, talk about, you know, what quality of life means to them, what they want for their health care. And, you know, just recently finding out that it looks like Medicare will be looking to pay physicians starting next January for the same kind of that. conversation. So it's really all about trying to get the converse, normalizing this conversation and having even, you know, people like you and me having these conversations with our families so that they know when something happens, you know, and obviously most important for people who have chronic illness or serious illness at the end of life. So looking at um, both supporting our physicians in um, how to have those conversations and also providing resources, advanced care planning clinics so that our patients could come to understand what is advanced care planning, what are these documents and how do I fill them out and what do I need to think about and talk to my family about. Does that mean that um, if you're a member of the CIPN, if you're a doctor, you'll have a resource at the CIPN admin team to go out and do it? How will that work? Yeah, so we actually have a nurse who's a, our advanced care planning coordinator. She has decades of experience doing this kind of work. Um, and she right now is sort of a mobile clinic, if you will. She's been to the neighbor island. She's out west. She's here at Punchbowl Campus uh, downtown. Um, and, and so she holds actually clinics with usually two to four patients and generally good if they bring their loved one with them to really talk about what are the various documents that can be filled out, none of which need to have a, a lawyer present. One of them does need your physician or a nurse practitioner to sign, but she really walks people through, you know, how do you think about this and how do you think about what's important to you and what your goals are? And whether you're, a, you know, a 75 year old who's very healthy, um, you know, we just never know what's going to happen. Or if you're somebody who really is facing serious illness and, and potentially the end of your life, you know, how do you think about these things and make sure that what you get is actually consistent with what your goals are? Because right now, if I'm not mistaken, a very small percentage of our, of our people in the state have taken advantage of that, have done a pulse or a living will or what have you. It's a small number, right? Yeah, it's relatively small. And I think that, you know, one of the great challenges coming back to technology is how do we make these documents available when somebody comes into the emergency room or when 911 is called? And so that's, you know, technologically speaking, it is another thing that, you know, HMSA in Queens and uh, Hawaii Pacific Health are looking at of, you know, how could we find a solution for that as well? So that once we've actually got these things documented, that people can actually find these documents and know what this person wants when they can no longer speak for themselves because of an emergency. So that's great. So that's one of the things we're looking at is really trying to, with multiple different efforts, um, expand the number of patients who've had that opportunity to express their desires and goals. So that's basically if you want care but you don't want a certain specific invasive or intervention kind of care, your doctors will know when you go. Um, so it's clarity at the end of life. Um, so that's one big program. I can imagine that has major major impact on cost and on people's quality yep. of health at the end of life. Yep. Give me another example. So another example would be trying to reduce unnecessary use of the emergency department. I mean, we all recognize that we need emergency rooms. They provide, you know, great service when people need them. Yes. Um, but there are a lot of people who go to the emergency room because they have a urinary tract infection or because they have a cough um, who, you know, might be able to be seen in another um, setting. So maybe urgent care if it can't be, if it can't wait. And, you know, we recognize that part of that challenge is our urgent care is only open till seven o'clock yeah. and you know, we know that the need for that kind of service is probably from you know 6 p.m. till midnight or 4 p.m. till midnight when the physician's offices are closed so looking at you know what might be some of the solutions in that area how do we how do we um, give patients a resource so that if they can't reach their physician that they might be able to find somebody who could say you know that could wait till tomorrow I'll make sure your physician follows up with you tomorrow or their office follows up to give you an appointment for tomorrow because I think there are things that really need care at that time, so after hours. And there are things that if the person could actually get somebody to say, oh yeah, you know what, we'll be able to see you tomorrow, that they would be reassured and they could probably wait till the next day. Well, that's it, that's very telling because I had a patient this past Sunday who um, this individual has had uh, chronic uh, liver failure, had um, severe pain, chronic pain. They are waiting for a pain uh, consultation to, to, you know, to have a pain specialist help them. Their primary care physician was away and they've twice had to go to the ER, I use the word had uh, loosely, but have twice gone to the ER for prescriptions uh, to get important pain medications mm -hmm. for their quality of life. And they are, this person was in pain and had to have the medications. But definitely to have emergency room visits at relatively high cost, which is paid for by uh, them and the taxpayers across the country, uh, is very inefficient. And they, this, this individual felt, um, self-conscious about coming to the ER for just a, a prescription for a piece of paper but they didn't have anywhere else to turn because of 
their circumstance and the shortage of providers. And also, I didn't know that patient well, so I couldn't even be a very high quality physician for them because I didn't know them as their primary care provider. So that's a classic example, I think, of a good program that CIPN is doing that might be able to decrease cost on businesses and people alike. So that's, I'm really, that's terrific. Mm -hmm. Give me another example of something that you're doing. So, you know, we're looking at additional programs for trying to improve the quality that's provided for our diabetic patients, obviously a really large population sure. here in Hawaii, um, and then perhaps linked to that too, because diabetes tends to, um, in many patients, become problems with their kidneys. So people who have kidney failure as well, um, trying to get them education, trying to um, have them understand the progression of that disease and you know obviously our goal is to keep people off of dialysis so keep keep their diabetes in better control have diabetic education um, will be one of our big pushes to get people into education classes so they understand um, their disease and, and hopefully how to manage it better um, and hopefully you know this is I think this is one of the challenges with the construct that we have now you know with these integrated networks and our accountable care organizations is that people are looking for um, things that will have benefit in one year's time. Our contract is one year, and we know that the right thing to do is to help people where we know the payoff may be, you know, three or five or ten years out, but this is really the best thing for this community. So looking at really providing additional um, education around diabetes, additional education around um, kidney disease um, in, in, a help, in, a, in an effort to try and um, coordinate care better, get people um, more engaged about their own health care. I mean, we know that that's part of the solution. So. Yeah, so it sounds like it almost requires a leap of faith on behalf of the partners, whether it's Queens or HMSA, with our, our thousand physicians, because they have to realize next year they're not going to see a decrease in the number of people on dialysis or with stage 4 uh, renal disease. But five, ten years out, if 20% fewer people are requiring dialysis, which costs tens of thousands of dollars every year, all of health care costs can come down most importantly the patient suffering comes down someone doesn't have to go to dialysis three times a week but with the expansion of technology and these huge healthcare costs it really is kind of an interesting partnership that you formed with um, Queens and HMSA. Give me a couple more in our last few minutes and, and then we'll wrap. Yeah, so we're really looking to work closely with many of our specialists and see, you know, I think that the primary care um, physicians are a pretty well organized group and I think our specialists are much more diffuse and independent and so we're looking at engaging many more of them around various different initiatives um, and really giving them the opportunity to define what quality is within their specialty within the QCIPN. Um, I think one of the things that we're really interested in looking at um, is mental health, as I mentioned, and looking at how we might uh, work with our psychiatrist colleagues um, around integration into primary care. There have been a number of examples, certainly one of them is Intermountain Health in Salt Lake City, um, that's been enormously successful at, at integrating um, mental health services into primary care. Again, kind of a challenge in our setting because we have all of these small practices, right. um, but I think that you know it, it's worth putting some minds together to say, well, okay, how might we design things to be able to provide care for this population? Um, looking, working with our nephrologists, our kidney doctors, around knowing, I think particularly in areas where we have shortages of physicians, where we know that we already have sewer shortages and people are going to be retiring and we'll have even greater shortages to meet the needs of all the patients we have. So looking at how can we work with you? How can we look as a network to figure out how are we going to provide care for all of these patients going forward? Um, you know, are there ways that maybe we could have, um, you know, mid-level providers, so nurse practitioners and PAs who might do some of that care if we really, uh, you know, end up with shortages and not enough. You know, I mean, I had somebody say to me today, actually I think right outside the studio, why does it take three months to get to see a primary care physician. Well, you know, the same holds true for kidney doctors and other specialists in the state. It's just that they're very long wait lists and, um, you know, I think that there are issues that need to be, um, have some thought put to them about what the solutions are going to be. So it sounds, uh, as we come to the close of our program today, and I'm so appreciative of you coming on, that you're asking physicians uh, to utilize the Queen's Clinically Integrated Physician Network, the CIPN, as a tool a tool to unite and unify the healthcare system, to have uh, some access to new programs, to maybe streamline some of the processes that have become onerous, referrals or this or that, uh, but at the same time to be able to look years out and say, how can we in Hawaii make our healthcare system more efficient for patients, better for patients, more appropriate for patients, and just maybe save some resources along the way. Absolutely. We didn't talk about it. I know that you're, um, you are compensating physicians uh, to participate in the program. 
why don't we just uh, kind of leave it there? We'll have an opportunity to have people write to you. Why don't you tell us a place to contact you at the CIPN? What's yeah, the, so it's, it's A. Lowengard, A-L-O-E-N-G-A-R-D, at queens.org. Great. And so uh, for people who want to join, we kind of keep, we, we do keep deadlines about when people can sign up, but we're interested in having a, a larger and larger community. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you've been very good at that because it's been quite impressive to see this many people sign up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're going to end there. Uh, this has been a very interesting discussion. I'm Josh Green with Anna Lowengard, the Chief Medical Officer of the Queen CIPN. Please contact her if you'd like to participate. Uh, please consider this an opportunity for us to improve the healthcare system in Hawaii. Thanks for joining us.